the Kenyan government, after the presidential election, the president immediately announced removing a subsidy. And it was an uproar. But guess what happened? Everybody economized it for some way, some reason. They economized it. And this is the new normal now. Prices went up, but it stabilized, and the businesses were shocked. But everything normalized. So as we go to that now, if you look at the next slide, When you're selecting a board for your company, you have to understand the different skill sets that you want on your board. Um, it, it is important to know that the different verticals and the kind of the kind of value that the uh, the board member would bring to your board. Now, it first is first is to scout around those that align with the values of your business. 
and then the, 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 the capacity that they are bringing in, into the competence that they are bringing into your board. Um, we, 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 we always advise that you have multiple competences on your board based on the business that you're doing. So somebody in your industry, a subject matter expert, someone that would look at your financials and to make sure that you're doing well, someone that would look at your corporate governance. Those, those are the easy ones. Some people want brand, uh, people that have marketing and branding competence on them. And once you identify that these are the needs that you want on your board, then you begin to look first in your immediate network. Uh, and then before you start to then go into the next circle, the next circle um, uh, uh, of, of people around you. So, so it, it, it's, it's important that if you identify the people, don't hesitate to approach. Um, when you say, how do I get to them? You write to them, we should hunt them on LinkedIn, um, look for six degrees of network to get to them, uh, and just be very dogged about it because that is what you want for the benefit of your business. So that, that is the way you want to select. And, and then I know that um, certain businesses, uh, particularly SMEs, are very reluctant to have a board uh, because of the, they think that the board will stall a lot of their decisions and, and all of that. Um, but it is more important for you to have them to stall your decisions and put you and guide you aright than for you to go without them. And then some people talk about affordability of the board. Now, certain boards um, would understand, because if they align with you, it's, it's the best interest of your company they come to, 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 to um, handle. And so when they come in there and they understand that your balance sheet is not doing well, then it will be, it will be a remix of them to start asking for board fees. However, others decide that look, they would have an advisory board um, rather than have them as a paid board. So you can also choose an advisory board. It, it is almost all, always the same thing because you have people that can guide and advise you. So that would be my response. So I work for a company called Afex, we're a commodities exchange. We work across uh, Africa. And uh, I fully recognize what you say. There are a lot of smallholders and there is a lot of potential. We have the land, we have the people to produce much more. Um, I think looking at the problem, we all know what's at stake. Uh, over 60% of Africans has experienced some level of food insecurity this year. 60%, let it sink in. Uh, total Africa food import bill is about $35 billion now, and it's expected to triple in the next two years. Um, also, having looked at the developments of the world globally, uh, there are many more shocks in recent years than there used to be. Uh, between COVID, the container ship that blocked the Suez Canal, uh, the war in Ukraine, there are global supply chain disruptions. So the, the cost and reliability of imports is at stake. So we need to fix this. Um, the good news is the potential is there. The sense of urgency is there. What is needed to tap into that is a model that allows to invest in farming in Africa. Um, Smallholder farming can be financed if there are tight value chains. If there's a buyer that has relationships with those farmers can help them uh, providing inputs, providing knowledge, uh, and then market access for, for the product. Um, we quite often see this happen in supply chains that are tied to uh, processors. Uh, I think Afi can probably uh, elaborate on that as well. Um, beside that, I do think we also need to look at ways of uh, moving away from the smallholder model alone. Um, so what we're looking at is also options for setting up, say, agricultural estates, um, either large-scale farming or like clusters of uh, medium-sized farmers that, for example, share equipment um, with rental mechanisms and such. Um, 
but the connection and the aggregation is very important because otherwise uh, agriculture will not become investable. Um, when we fix that, I do think there's indeed a large untapped potential of uh, food production on the continent. Thank you. Suddenly, the only policy that I could speak to, <laughs> anyway. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> um, I was very interested in what uh, um, my friend from Coman, Coman Kebu was talking about, about deficits, particularly zeroing in on transmission, and what he said about decentralization. I think that might be the key word I want to leave with us in terms of, um, and again, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough about the African situation to speak to Africa generally, or perhaps certainly, you know, with regard to Nigeria, I think we, we need to have another look at um, the framework or the paradigm that we've tried to use in solving our problems. I think it's pretty clear that it hasn't worked and we need to have another look. And as it, as it happens, you know, um, so people are, are looking at that already. I think, you know, if you, if you see the amendment to the, to the, um, you know, the uh, Electricity Se Sector Act at the National Assembly. Uh, there are moves, you know, to introduce amendments, particularly with regard to empowering states, for example, um, to, to have um, state electricity markets. The thing about it, the, I, you, you can see that centralization was well-intentioned. There's something to do, um, there are benefits in scale, planning at a national, federal level for all the segments, but it hasn't worked. So we need to have another look. And I think that that's really the way to go. Um, I think that we need to, we can, we can look at things at the national level in terms of, you know, the various options we have, you know, to uh, provide for our energy mix. But in terms of implementation, I think that, uh, you know, the, the private sector and the states and need to be empowered to, 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 to go with it. What it would mean is that you're going to have uh, different parts of the country moving at, at, at different uh, paces. But I think that's fine. You know, we have a, such a huge deficit, you know, and you'll find that in many areas, it may be commercial, if you use that word, to, you know, the private sector can provide, you know, in some areas, and then government can focus on those areas that need subsidizing. We can't wait for everyone to move at the same pace. That, that's, that's what I would say for now. Okay, thank you. For me, quite uh, a few lessons, and I think different stakeholders um, have different layers of lessons to focus on. Um, the first one is the entirety of the beneficiaries, which is you and I, the right this um, I do think that, first and foremost, uh, it's clear to everyone that a pandemic of the size and the scale of COVID-19 will eat any generation, and it happened. 
I don't think before COVID um, we ever forced us you know, that level of pandemic or disease to really attack us um, as a global space. But having said that, um, it's also to layer it with the the unraveling of the events that despite the frailty of the health systems in Africa, in Nigeria, um, COVID still made us stretch it further and stretch them further. So no matter what we claim that you know, we have um, next to no existing you know, support uh, in health and healthcare, or very frail or non-existing um, health facilities and infrastructure. The pandemic hit Nigeria. The pandemic hit Africa. And you and I are still seated. So it's just to say that um, there's a lot ongoing uh, that we have next to no control around. And things like this just open up the mind and the understanding that uh, we need to be more prepared uh, for any of such you know, level of interference uh, with normal everyday living. So that's, that's a general uh, lesson learned for, from uh, a beneficiary's point of view. If you look at investors, um, it's also to say that opportunities actually really came out uh, in the sense that more and more awareness around where the opportunities are, especially in Africa, did really uh, resonate. And um, what's also happened is that there's a multi-stakeholder uh, awareness. Um, and I think after COVID, I'm just uh, assuming that we're after COVID now, um, more and more realization about the necessary multi-stakeholder engagements that needs to take place is now taking place. So in other words, it's not left to the health community alone to address the frailty of the health systems um, in Africa or in Nigeria as a nation. It's the responsibility of every unit of stakeholders. So that's the community, um, the business community, the health community, the government, uh, uh, the international donors, United Nations, and so on and so forth. So, as in a nutshell, the lessons learned from it comes across layers and each person or each group um, has something to learn. For the uh, investment space, just like the investors, I think it opens up um, also the frailty of the African health system, uh, especially uh, for the international community to observe and to understand what is needed in terms of support uh, to get that, to get our health system stronger that it currently is. I will Thank you very much. Great. It's not the land. It is the technical know-how. Why are countries poor, volatile, and unequal? There's a reason why Nigeria is so big in terms of land mass and population. And our economy is so poor. Our people and economy are so poor compared to countries that are like 10 times, you know, smaller than we are. It's the technical know-how of our people. How do we fix the skills gap? Because you now have a country where graduates of mechanical engineering from universities leave school and they have never touched any iron, any metal. So I graduated from Unilag. My car dies on Third Milan Bridge. I then call a local sharafa to come and fix it. You studied electrical engineering. Your bulb goes off in your house. You are afraid to touch lights. Electrical engineer. Then you now call a local electrician to come and fix it. One person has the knowledge, theory. The other person has the skill, practical. My dictionary has told me that the people that have skill will always be, be superior to the people that have the knowledge. Thank you. What is the likelihood of the election going to a second round? Thank you. Very high likelihood. Very, it's, it's, it's likely. But so the thing about it is that um, 
statistically, with data, it would, it would tell you it's likely. But understand this, if all three parties are able to secure 24 states, suddenly 1% of 30 million voters, which is 300,000 voters, is enough to make somebody the winner. So statistically, it will always look high. Um, I think that at no point in Nigeria's history has it looked more likely that we'll have a run as it does today. The great part of our election is that it is a balance of terror. So how does it work? Each party, big enough party, nominates people that go to the CBN or whatever point holds the material and escorts the material to the individual polling units. Now, and this is a very unfortunate for the obedience. This is why they talk about political structure. Because what would then happen is that APC and PDP, which have a structure across every unit in Nigeria, has people that go follow the materials to the units intact. You would need to compromise both sides for anything to happen. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. It's been known to happen. But is it, does it happen in up to 10% of the units in Nigeria? Absolutely not. That's the first thing. Um, second thing, when you do get there, part of the strategy on election day is having your agents. Um, the three major parties, the, the agent list in Nigeria has over 40 different parties. The, the party list in Nigeria has over 40 different parties. Not all of them have candidates. You partner with some so that you have enough agents overseeing the voting process. So it's not going to be easy to just hijack from the umpires the voting process. And again, I assume that if you are going to go all the way to presidential election, whatever your opponent is gifting the umpire, you must be willing to match it. It goes without saying. Finally, the beavers. The be beavers' ultimate um, capacity is to check over voting. What's happened is the voter register has been pre-programmed into the beavers. So a situation where you have people crossing from unit to unit to vote, or a situation where you have people take um, INEC officials and just over thumbprint has been checked. The people that are pre-registered per unit in the beavers are the only people that can, that can vote in, the, in that unit. And what they also did get right is that it works on and offline. So because it's pre-programmed, offline it works. As soon as there is a reception, it gets sent to the cloud. What the complaint has been is, and I mean, there was a news line on this a couple of months ago, is oh, they heard that hackers were going to hack the cloud instead because they can't touch the beavers. So they want to hack the cloud instead and pre-program the results. Um, again, like I say, election is a balance of terror. If the other person go to Russian hackers, you go and get Israeli hackers. It's, it's not, you're not here for classroom prefect, you're here for president.